Good evening to everyone out there. Welcome to Relative Theatrics Reading Greek Tragedy Online Series. Tonight's reading is Alcestis by Euripides. My name is Noelia Burkus and I am the Director of Virtual Programming. Tonight's reading is being presented in conjunction with the Center for Hellenic Studies, Cosmos Society, and Out of Chaos Theater. Following the reading, there will be a discussion with the cast, crew, and some community members led by Dr. Laura Delosier. If you'd like to join the discussion via Zoom, you can email Anne at amason at relativetheatrics.com to receive the access link and directions. I'll also put that in the chat box once we get going. We would love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also sign up for our mailing list to find out about future programming from Relative Theatrics. We are offering tonight's reading free of charge. However, if you believe in the work that we're creating, we would be so grateful for your donations of any amount as a token of your support. The actors you are about to see are donating their talents in kind and any donation goes towards fairly compensating them for their work. There are links posted in the comments to our Facebook and PayPal account where you can give online, but you can also mail us a check. If you are in Laramie, I hope you are enjoying a wine and cheese pairing from Chalk and Cheese. They are creating specific themed pairings for our virtual readings and Misty is generously donating 10% of pairing sales to Relative Theatrics. I'll raise a glass to that. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Wyoming Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and the National Endowment for Humanities for their generous grant funding. Thank you and enjoy the show. Alcestis by Euripides. Our cast of characters include Apollo, god of poetry, prophecy, and plague. Thanatos, death in person. The chorus, citizens of Thessaly. Maid, personal servant to Alcestis. Alcestis, wife of Admetus, daughter of Peleus. Admetus, husband of Alcestis, ruler of Thessaly, son of fairies. Children, the children of Alcestis and Admetus. Heracles, a Greek hero. Fairies, father of Admetus, retired king of Thessaly. Servant, personal servant to Admetus. The town is Pherae, a town in Thessaly. The play is set in the heroic age in the generation before the Trojan War. Hail the halls of Admetus, where I had to eat with the underclass, though I am a god. Zeus is to blame for this. He killed my son, Asclepius, striking him in the heart with lightning. I got mad and I got even. I killed the Cyclops, makers of Zeus's fire. Then my father made me serve a mortal man as his slave to punish me. So I came to this land and tended sheep for my host. And up till now, I have been the protector of this house. Yes, being holy myself, I found him holy, the son of fairies. I rescued him from death by tricking the fates. For my sake, the goddesses agreed to let Admetus escape his present death if he found a substitute to give the gods below. He made the rounds, he asked them all, his nearest and dearest, his father and the old woman who gave him birth, his mother. But he found not one save his wife who was willing to die for him and give up the daylight. Now in the halls, she needs help even to stand up. Her last gasp cannot be far off. Today is the day she is destined to die and leave, and leave this life. But as for me, to avoid the filth of death under the roof, I am leaving this house with fond memories. And I already see death come round, priest of the deceased, who is going to take her down to the halls of Hades. 
he has come right on time, keeping track of the day she has to die. Aha! What are you doing in front of the halls? Why are you hovering about this place, Phoebus? Are you still stealing from the lower gods, trying to end our honors? Is that your game? Aren't you satisfied with forestalling Admetus' death, using a dirty trick to trip the fates? Now, with bow in hand, are you looking out for her, his wife, who contracted to redeem her husband by dying in his place, his wife, the daughter of Peleus? Not to worry. I'm not a crook, you know. My word is good. What is the bow for if you are not crooked? It's just I always carry it. It's part of my costume. And you always help this house unjustly? Yes, because it upsets me when my friend is in trouble. Well, are you going to rob me of the second corpse? But I did not take even him by force. How is it that he is still up here and not six feet under? He let his wife take his place. She is the one you have come after. Yes, I shall certainly take her down to those who live below. Take her then and go. I guess I can't convince you. To kill my victims? This is what I am made for. No, but to bring death to those ready to die. I get your meaning and your intent. Is there no way that Alcestis can come to an old age? There is not. You have to realize that I enjoy my honors too. You won't get more than one life anyway. I get a juicier prize when the young die. And yet if she dies in old age, she will have a rich funeral. Your law favors the haves over the have-nots, Phoebus. What do you mean? Have you become a sophist and not told anybody? Those who could afford it would buy a ripe old age. I suppose you are not going to do me this favor. No, not really. You know what I am like. Yes, an enemy to men and to gods detestable. You can't have everything when it doesn't belong to you. You will go along with me in the end, intractable as you are. Such a man is coming to Fares' house, sent by Eurytheus after the team of horses from the wintry reaches of Thrace, who, after he has been entertained in the house of Admetus, by force will rob you of this woman. Then you will go get no thanks from me, but still, you will have to do it and I will still hate you. You have wasted your breath. The woman is going to Hades. I am going in for her now to begin the ritual with my sword. Anyone whose hair is consecrated by this sword is dedicated to the gods of the underworld. Why this silence at the gates? Why is the house of Admetus hushed? But no friend is near who might tell whether she is dead, and we must mourn our queen, or living still, she sees this day's light. The daughter of Peleus, Astestus, by me and everyone else, judged the best a wife could be to her husband. Does anyone hear the sounds of mourning, or the beating of hands within the house, or moaning as when the end has come? No, and there's no attendant posted at the gates. If only amid the waves of disaster, oh, Payan, would you appear? If she were gone, they would not be silent. She is dead now. But not gone from the house. Why do you think so? I'm not so confident. What makes you sure? How could Admetus have buried his noble wife without mourners? Beside the gates, I do not see the spring water that is the custom at the gates of the dead. No cut lock of hair is at the front gates, which falls in mourning for the dead. No young hand of women can be heard beating. And this is truly the fated day. What is this you say? On which she must go below. Ah, you have touched my soul. You have touched my heart. When the good people are worn down with misery, all good people must grieve with them. But there is no place left on earth where anyone, 
by making a sea voyage either to Lycia or to the waterless altars of Ammon might save the life of the unhappy woman for the untimely end of her life approaches. By the hearths of the gods, there is no sacrificial priest I may approach. But he is alone. If only he were seeing this day's light with his eyes, Phoebus' the son, then leaving the shadowy places in the gates of Hades, she might come back. For he used to raise the dead until the Zeus cast bolt of blazing thunder took him away. But now, what hope of life may I entertain? All is over for the royal family at the altars of all the gods. Full sacrifices are streaming with blood, but there is no cure for these ills. But look, one of the maids is coming out of the house with tears in her eyes. What news will I hear? We don't need an excuse to grieve if something happens to our rulers. Is the lady alive or has she passed away? We would like to know. You could say that she is both living and dead. But how can the same person be dead and alive? She can barely stand, and her last gasp cannot be far off. Oh, poor man. What a man you are. What a wife you are losing. The master doesn't know this yet. Not until he experiences it. Is there no hope of saving her life? The faded day is making itself felt. Then are all the preparations being made for her? Yes. She is dressed up for the funeral. I hope she realizes that she is dying gloriously and is by far the best wife under the sun. What else but the best? Who is there to challenge her? What would a woman have to do to surpass her? How could anyone better show that she puts her husband first than by dying for him? And the whole city knows about it but you will be amazed to hear what she did in the house. When she felt that the appointed day had come, with flowing water, she washed her fine skin and taking from the cedar closet clothing and accessories, she dressed herself becomingly. Then, standing before the altar of Hestia, she prayed, Mistress, since I am going down below the earth, this is the last time I will fall on my knees before you. Take care of my orphaned children. Wed to my boy a dear wife, and to my girl a noble husband. Do not let them, like their mother, die before their time. But let my children be happy in their father's land and complete a happy span. She went to all the altars that there are in Admetus' house, and she crowned them all with garlands and prayed at them, pulling leaves from the myrtle branches, without tears, without complaint, even her complexion was unbellished by the advancing evil. And then flinging herself into her bedroom and onto her bed, there at last she let the tears fall and said, my bed where I gave up my virginity to this man and for whom now I am giving up my life. Goodbye. I do not hate you though you have destroyed only me, but I was reluctant to betray you and my husband and so I am dying. Another woman will get you no more virtuous than I, but maybe luckier. Throwing herself upon the bed, she planted kisses on it, and all the bedcloths were wet with her flood of tears. But when she finished crying, tearing herself from the bed, she started to go out. Her head bent down, but again and again, she turned back and threw herself back on the bed. The children were crying, clinging to their mother's dress. And she took them in her arms and one after the other, she kissed them goodbye because she was dying. All the servants were crying everywhere in the house, feeling sorry for their mistress, but she held out her right hand to each and no one was so low that she did not speak to him and hear what he had to say. Such is the tragedy of the Admetus house. If he had died, he would be done with it. But by escaping, he has so much grief that he will never forget it. Surely Admetus is lamenting these troubles if he must lose his excellent wife. Yes, he is crying, holding his dear wife in his arms as he begs her not to abandon him. Impossible wish. 
She is fading fast, wasting away with illness, and she's fallen in a faint, a pitiful burden in his arms. But still, even though she is scarcely breathing, she wants to come out for a look at the sunlight for the very last time, never again to see the bright face of the sun. I will go in and announce your arrival. Not everybody thinks well enough of their kings to stand by them in their troubles, but you are old friends of my masters. Ah, Zeus, what way out of evils? How, where might there be a way? And release from the fortune that is upon our rulers. Oh no, will anyone come or must I cut my hair and change into black clothes of mourning? Ah, uh, it is plain, friends, plain, but still, let us pray to the gods, for great is the might of the gods. Oh, Lord Payan, find a way out of the evils for Admetus. Grant one, grant it. For even before this, you discovered a way. Even now, be a savior from death. Stop bloody Hades. How sad. Oh, child of Fariz. How badly you have fared, deprived of your wife. Ah, are these not things to make a man cut his throat and more than enough to tie a rope around his neck? For you will see your dear wife, the dearest wife in the world, die on this day. Look, look, she is coming out and her husband with her. Cry out, lament, O Ferian land for the best of wives wasting away with sickness and going beneath the earth to Hades. Never will I say that marriage brings more delight than grief. Earlier experience tells me this and it is confirmed now by seeing this the misfortune of the king who will lose the world's best wife and live out an unlivable life. Sun and light of day, heavenly whirlings of running cloud. Yes, the sun sees you and me, two unhappy people who have done nothing against the gods for which you should die. Earth and roof of the house, bridal bed of my native Ayol. Raise yourself, poor thing. Do not abandon me. Beg the mighty gods to have mercy. I see a two-oared boat, I see it in a lake, and the ferryman of the dead holding his hand on the pole, Charon, is calling me now. Why are you delaying? Hurry along, you are keeping us back. That is how gruffly he hurries me. Oh no, bitter to me is the voyage you speak of. My poor dear, what we are suffering. He is taking me. Someone is taking me. Someone is taking me, don't you see? Into the halls of the dead. He's looking out at me under dark brows. He has wings. Death, let me go. What are you doing? Let me go. Such a journey I am making. Saddest of all. Sad to your friends, but especially to me and the children who share this sorrow. Let me loose now. Let me loose, put me down. My legs are too weak to stand. Death is near. Dark night is coming over my eyes. Children, children, your mother, you have no mother. Goodbye, my children. May you live in the sunlight. No, no. These words are misery to my ears and worse than any other death for me. Do not, by the gods, do not abandon me. In the name of the children whom you are leaving orphan, do not. Stand up, be brave. If you die, I can't survive. We depend on you to live or die. Your love gives meaning to our lives. Admetus, you see how things are with me. I need a word with you before I die. I put you ahead of my own life so that you would be in the sunlight. And I am dying, even though I could stay alive for you and could have a husband, anyone I wanted in Thessaly and live like a queen in a wealthy home. 
but I did not want to live without you, with my children orphan. And I did not spare my youth, though I am young and have had a happy life. And yet your father and mother abandoned you, though they had reached an age at which it would become them to die, with honor to save their son and bow out graciously. You were all they had, an only child. There was no hope with you gone for them to have any more children. And then I would be alive and you too for the rest of our lives. And you would now be mourning the loss of your wife and bringing up motherless children. But this is the work of one of the gods that it has to be like this very well. You remember now what you owe me for I will ask you nothing comparable, you know, there is nothing comparable, more precious than life, but something fair, as I am sure you will agree. You love these children no less than I, if your heart is in the right place. Bring them up to be masters in my house. And do not marry another woman to be their stepmother, who will be a worse woman than I, and out of spite, will raise her hand to my children, yours too. A stepmother coming into a family where there are children by the first wife is as tender as a viper. Our son has his father as a tower of strength to talk to him and listen to what he has to say. But you, my little daughter, what kind of girlhood will you have? What sort of wife of your father will you have to live with? I am worried that she will spread some nasty rumor about you in the prime of your youth and destroy your chances for marriage. Your mother will not be able to attend your wedding. She won't be with you when you give birth, my baby, when nothing is more comforting than a mother. I am dying and it's not tomorrow or on the third of next month. This tragedy is coming right now. I will not be here anymore. Goodbye and be happy. You, my husband, can brag that you had the best wife in the world and you, children, that you were born of the best mother. Never fear. I do not hesitate to speak for him. He will do as you say, unless he has taken leave of his senses. Not to worry. I will do it. I will do it since I had only you while you were living. When you die, you will be called my only wife, and no one instead of you will be my bride and call me husband. For there is no one so well-born, nor any woman more beautiful. I have enough children. I pray the gods to be able to enjoy them since we will not enjoy you. I will grieve for you, not for a year only, but as long as my life lasts, my wife, hating my mother and hating my father, they were friends in word, never in deed, but you gave up what was dearest to you and saved my life. Isn't it right then for me, losing such a wife as you to grieve? I shall put an end to the revels and parties and garlands and music which cheered up my house. Never again could I touch the lyre strings, nor lift my spirit to sing to the Libyan flute. For you have taken all joy from my life. Your likeness, made by a skillful artist, will be placed in my bed, and I will fall upon it and hold it in my arms and call your name and feel like I'm holding my dear wife in my arms. Of course, I will not hold her, a cold comfort, but still it would relieve the burden of my heart. Coming in dreams, you could bring me pleasure, for it is sweet to see dear ones, even at night, for as long as they can stay. If I had the tongue of Orpheus and his gift for song to charm the daughter of Demeter and her husband with songs and bring you back, I would go down and neither Hades' dog nor Charon, the ferryman of the dead at his oar, would hold me back until I had restored you to life. 
but wait for me there until I die. And make a home for me so we can live together when I'm dead. For I shall leave instructions to be laid out in the same coffin and to lie side by side with you and not even in death ever to be apart from you. The only one loyal to me. And I too, as a friend for a friend, will bear this painful grief for her, for she is worthy. Children, you have heard with your own ears your father promised that he would not ever marry another woman to lord it over, to lord it over you and to dishonor me. Yes, and I say it again, and I will do it. On these terms, take the children from me. I take them, a dear gift from a dear hand. You be their mother instead of me. I will have to since you won't be there. Oh, children, I should leave, but I must go. Oh, no! What will I do without you? Time will soften your grief. The dead are nothing. Take me with you, in God's name, take me with you. My death is enough. I am dying for you. Oh, God, what a wife I'm losing. My eyes are growing dark and heavy. I'm dead if you will leave me, my wife. You can say that I am gone. Lift up your head. Do not leave your children. I do not want to, but goodbye, children. Look at them, look. Nothing is left of me. What are you doing? Are you leaving? Goodbye. Poor me. I'm dead. She is dead. The wife of Admetus is gone for good. Oh, I'm so unlucky. Mama has gone away. Oh, Father, she's not here anymore. She's gone and left me an orphan. Look, look at her eyelids and her hands. They're limp. Hear me, please listen, Mother. I beg you. It is me. I am calling you, your own little bird leaning over your lips. She does not hear or see you. I have been knocked flat, and you too, by a heavy blow. I am young, father. I am left on my own without my mother. Oh, I have suffered awful things. And you, little sister, have suffered with me. Oh, Father, for nothing, nothing. You married and you did not grow old with her. She died first. Mother, mother, with you gone, our home is gone. Admetus, you must bear this tragedy. You are neither the first nor the last of mortals to lose a good wife. You have to learn that death is a debt we all must pay. Yes. I do know, and this tragedy did not hit me out of the blue. I have known about it and been in agony for a long, long time. Now I must take care of her funeral. Stand by me and stay to sing the chorus to the deaf God of the dead. I command all the Thessalians over whom I rule to share in the morning for this woman with cut hair and black robes. And you who yoke the four horse chair and you who ride single steeds, take your swords and cut the hair from the mane. There will be no sound of flutes in the city, nor of the lyre for 12 full months. For I will never bury anyone dearer than she, nor better to me. She is worthy of respect because she died for me, the only one who would. O oh, daughter of Pelias, be happy for me in the house of Hades where you live in the sunless halls. But Hades, the black haired God must know, and the old ferryman of the dead who sits by the oar and rudder, that he rose you, far and away the best woman, over the lake Acheron in the two oared pine boat. Many are songs the servants of the muses will sing to, of you to the seven-toned mountain lyre, and they will celebrate in lyreless hymns in Sparta. 
when the cycle of the season of the month of Carnaeus returns, when the moon is up all night long and in shining happy Athens. Such hymns of praise did you leave to the singers when you died. If it were only up to me and I were able to bring you into the light from Hades halls and across the streams of Cocytus, rowing across the river under the world. For you alone, dearest of women, had the heart to give your life in exchange for your husband's, saving him from death. Light may be the earth fall upon you, my queen, but if your husband makes a second marriage in this house, we will despise him and so will your children. When his mother refused to let her body be buried in the ground for her child and his aged father too, for their son whom they gave life, they had not the courage to save him, hard-hearted, gray-headed couple. But in your early youth, dying for your husband, you are gone. I hope I am lucky enough to get such a partner. This rarely happens in life. She would live with me without pain throughout our lives. Friends, villagers of this land of Farai, do I find and meet us at home? The son of Fares is in the house, Heracles. But tell us, what brings you to the land of the Thessalons and this town of Farai? I am performing a labor for Eurystheus. And where are you going? Where do your travels take you? I'm going after the four-horse chariot of Diomedes of Thrace. How will you possibly do it? You must not know him. Never met the man. I've never been to the Bastonians before. There is no way to master the horses without a battle. But I can't just say no to the laborers. You will kill him and come back home, or else die there and never return. This will not be the first time I have taken a risk. What would you gain if you overpower their master? I will drive the horses down to the Lord of Tyrans. It is not easy to put a bit in their mouths. Well, unless they breathe fire from their nostrils. Not that, but they tear men to pieces with their blood-stained jaws. That sounds more like wild beasts than horses. You can see their mangers red with blood. Whose son does their master expect us to believe he is? Ares' son. He is king of the golden Thracian shield. That is the story of my life. It is always tough and an uphill battle if I must fight with the children Ares fathered, first like Haon and Cygnus, and now this is the third battle with the master and his horses that I must enter into. But there is no one who will see the son of Alcmene quaking before an enemy's hand. And here is the king of our land himself, Admetus coming out of the house. Good cheer, son of Zeus, child of Perseus' blood. Good cheer to you too, Admetus, king of the Thessalians. I wish, but I know you mean well. What is the matter? Why is your hair cut in mourning? I have to bury someone today. God, protect your children from harm. The children are alive in my house. Your father has reached a ripe old age if he is gone. He is fine. My mother too, Heracles. Your wife, Alcestis, isn't dead. There are two ways of looking at it. Is she dead or still alive? Yes and no. But I grieve for her. I do not understand. You don't make sense. Don't you know the fate she must meet? Yes, I know that she has undertaken to die in your place. How is she still with us if she has agreed to do that? Uh, don't grieve for your wife in advance. Put it off till the time comes. She's going to die. The dead are nothing. Alive and dead are considered two different things. You have your opinion, Heracles, and I have mine. Just why are you in mourning? Has someone died in the family? My wife 
It's a woman we were just now talking about. Is she an outsider or related to you by blood? Not exactly related, but vital to our house. How is that she died in your house? When her father died, she spent her life here. Too bad. I wish I had not found you in mourning. What are you getting at? I will find another friend to put me up. No, sir. It cannot be done. Perish the thought. It is an added burden for those in mourning if the guest stays over. The dead are dead. Come into the house. It is uncouth for guests to feast when the house is in mourning. The guest quarters are separate where you will stay. Please, let me go, and I will be very grateful. You must not go to another man's hearth. You, open the guest house for him and show him to his rooms, and tell the staff to serve him plenty of food. Close up the connecting doors carefully. It is uncouth for guests to be disturbed at their feasting by sounds of mourning. Doing? When such a thing has happened? Admetus, how could you invite a guest to stay here? Have you gone soft in the head? But if I had driven him away from my house and city when he came as a traveler, then would you have, then would you have approved of me more? No, oh, no. The misery would be no less, but I would not be a good host and friend. And I would have this tragedy on top of the other, that my house would be called unwelcoming to guests. I always find him a perfect host whenever I go to the thirsty land of Argos. How is it that you concealed the present misfortune from a man who came here if he is a friend? as you say. He would never have been willing to enter the house if he had known of my troubles. And maybe to some in doing this, I will seem foolish and those people will not approve. But my house does not know how to turn away guests nor to treat them badly. Oh, house of a hero, forever welcoming and free. In you, the Pythian Apollo of the beautiful lyre, deigned to dwell, and he endured to be a shepherd in your domain over the sloping hillsides piping to your flocks, bucolic ideals of love. In joy at the melodies, spotted lynxes were herded with them and the blood red pride of lions came, leaving the covert of Orthus and with them dance about your lyre, Phoebus. The dapple-coated fawn skipping from beyond the high-needled pines on graceful ankles rejoicing in the happy tune. For he dwells in a home most rich in sheep beside the fresh waters of Lake Babia. The boundary of his farmlands and the wide expanse of his plains and the dark resting place of the sun's horses, the Melancium realm, and on the Aegean Sea he rules up to the harborless shore of Pylaeon. And now, having opened his home, he has received a traveler with tears in his eyes from weeping over the body of his dear wife, just dead in the house. Good breeding brings out good deeds. In the brave heart is every sort of wisdom. I am stunned, but upon my soul confidence sits that a God-fearing man will fare well. Welcome company of citizens of Farai. Servants are lifting up the body properly adorned and carrying it to the tomb and pyre. You accompany the deceased on her last journey with a traditional song. I see your father coming at an old man's pace and servants with gifts for your wife in their hands Offerings for the lower world. Oh, 
Hey, fairies, you're muted. Will you start that speech over, please? Thank you. I have come to unmute myself, to sympathize with you and your troubles, my boy, for you have lost a fine and virtuous wife. No one will deny that. Still, you must get through these things, even though they're hard to bear. Receive these gifts and bury them with her. It is right to pay our respects to her body since she died for your life, my boy. And she did not make me childless and did not let me waste away without you, grieving in my sunset years. And she has made life more glorious for all women by undertaking this generous deed. Oh, you who have saved this man and lifted us up when we were low, farewell. Even in Hades halls, may it go well for you. I say that such marriages are profitable for mortals or it's not worth getting married at all. You were not invited to come to this funeral and yours is not a welcome presence here. She will never put on these gifts of yours. No, she will not be buried beholden to you. That was when you ought to have grieved with me when I was dying, but you kept out of the way and let someone else die, a young person, when you were old, and now you are ready to mourn her death? Are you really my natural father? Did that woman who claims to have given me birth and is called my mother really bear me? Or was I born of slaves' blood and deposited at your wife's breast in secret? You showed, coming to the test, who you are. And I do not think that I am your natural child. You are without a doubt the most cowardly man alive. You who are so old and have reached the finish line of life. You backed away and did not have the courage to die for your own son but you let this woman do it, not even a relative. She is the one I honestly think of as my mother. Yes, and my father too, only she. And yet this would have been a noble undertaking for you to die for your son. And you have only a little time left in your life. And then she and I would have lived for the rest of our lives and I would not be in mourning for her. And yet you have had everything that a happy man ought to have. In your youth, you enjoyed royal power. You had me as your son, an heir to your estate, so that you would not have to leave it without an heir to be dismantled. You will not say that I dishonored your old age and left you to die, since I was very respectful to you. And for that, here is the gratitude you and mother have shown. So hurry home and get started on some more children who will nurse you in old age and when you die, pay their last respects to your body. For I will not bury you with my hands. As far as you were concerned, I am dead. And if I see the light of day because someone else rescued me, I say that I am that person's child and the nurse of her old age. In vain, old people pray for death, curse sing their old age and long lifespan. But when death shows his face, no one wants to die and old age is no longer such a heavy burden. Stop it. Haven't you enough troubles already? My boy, do not excite your father's wrath. My boy, what has gotten into you? Do you think it is some Lydian or Phrygian slave bought for cash that you're insulting? Do you forget that I am a Thessalian and my father was a Thessalian to legitimate and freeborn? You are very abusive, spitting out your childish taunts. You will not get away like that with bad mouthing me. I gave you life. I brought you up to be the master of my house. It's not my duty to die for you. This is not a custom I received from my father that parents die for their children. It isn't the Greek way. 
for yourself you exist, whether happy or not. What was rightfully yours, you have received from me. You ruled a large kingdom, and I will leave you many acres of farmland. That's what I received from my father. How have I hurt you? What do I have that should be yours? Do not die for me, and I will not die for you. You're glad to be alive. Do you suppose your father is not? I figure I will spend a long, long time in the other world. Life is short, but it is still sweet. You fought tooth and claw to escape death, and now you are alive because you slunk past your appointed time and killed her. <laughs> Do you talk about my cowardice, you reprobate? Put in the shade by a woman who died for you, her fine young Adonis. You found a clever way of avoiding death. And if you will persuade each wife in turn to die for you, and then you reproach your loved ones, not for wanting to do this, when you're the coward, hold your tongue. Just think, if you love your own life that all men love theirs and the bad things you say of me, you'll hear the same about yourself and they will not be lies. Too much now has been said on top of the old troubles. But stop, old man. Do not badmouth your son. Have your say, since I have had mine. If you are pained to hear the truth, you should not have wronged me. I would have done you wrong if I had died for you. Is it the same for a young person and an old one to die? We get one life to live, not two. I hope you live to be older than Zeus. You curse your father, though you've suffered no wrong from me. I had the idea that you were fond of living long. But are you not laying out this corpse instead of your own? Proof of your mean spirit, you utter coward. She did not die for me. You'll not say that. <sighs> I hope one day you need me. Chase more women so that more will die. This is your disgrace, since you are not willing to die. I love the light of day. I love it. I don't want to die. Your spirit is mean. How can you call yourself a man? You are not laughing at an old man in that coffin. You'll die in disgrace when you do die. I don't care about my reputation after I'm gone. Ah, old men have no honor. She was not dishonorable. You found her foolish. Get out. Let me bury my dead. I'm going. You will bury her through, though you are her murderer. And you will be punished by her kin. Or Castus is not the man he was if he does not take vengeance for his sister's death. Go to hell. You and the woman you live with. Childless, though your child is living, go and grow old as you deserve. You will not come with me into the same house. If I had to publicly repudiate you as my father and my father's hearth, I would do it. But we... We must endure the present tragedy. Let us go so that we may put this body on the pyre. Ah, ah, brave in your daring, noble and most excellent. Farewell. Graciously may Hermes of the beyond and Hades receive you. If there is any reward in the hereafter for the brave and good, you have earned it. You will be seated beside the bride of Hades.
I have known many guests who come from all over the world to the house of Admetus, and I have served meals to all of them, but never in my life have I waited on a worse guest than this one in the house. From the beginning, he saw my master in mourning, but he came in anyway and crossed the threshold. Then he did not have the good manners to take what was available, seeing how upset we were, but if there was something we did not bring, he got rowdy and demanded it. He takes an ivy cup in his hands and he drinks the wine from the black grape unmixed until the flame of wine overtakes him and makes him hot. Then he crowns his head with myrtle branches, howling unmusically. There were two sounds to hear. He was singing without a thought for Admetus' tragedy. But we servants were mourning our mistress, but we did not show the stranger that we were weeping. Admetus had forbidden it. And now I am entertaining in the house this guest, some robber or reprobate, but she is gone from the house and I could not follow and pay my last respects to my mistress at the graveside. She was a mother to me and all the servants. Many times she saved our hide, soothing her husband's temper. Haven't I the right to hate this guest who has come in our time of trouble? <clears throat> hey, you. Why do you look so sober and righteous? A servant should not be sullen to guests, but give service with a smile. But you... When you see a man come to the house who is your master's friend, you treat him with gloomy looks and a scowl on your face and are more interested in the troubles of some outsider. Come here, let me teach you a thing or two. Do you know the secret of life? <laughs> I doubt it. How would you? Listen up. Everybody has to die sometime and nobody not a living soul knows if he will be alive tomorrow round and round she goes and where she stops nobody knows you can't learn it in school or work out a system now that you've heard this and don't forget that you learned it from me not to worry drink up live your life one day at a time the rest belongs to lady luck worship aphrodite sweet sweet goddess to men and women. Forget the rest and listen to what I'm saying if I make sense and I think I, I think I am. Won't you give up your infernal grief and come inside and have a drink with me? Let your hair down? I guarantee you that a raising a few glasses will carry you away from your from your gloomy constricted state of mind. Mortals have got to think mortal. To all you high and mighty disapproving types, if you want my opinion, you ought to little, live a little before you die. Life isn't all tragedy. I know all that, but laughing and carrying on are not appropriate in our present state of affairs. A woman is dead who is not even a member of the family. Don't grieve so much. The masters of the house are still alive. What do you mean alive? Do you know the trouble we're in? Yes unless your master deceived me. His hospitality goes way too far. Was I supposed to be put out because some stranger died? Stranger, yes, but actually too much a member of the family. Is there some tragedy that he did not tell me? Go on, goodbye. Master's troubles are our affairs. That does not sound much like other people's problems. Otherwise, I would not have been angry seeing you having a good time. What is it? Have I been treated shabbily by my hosts? You did not come at the right time for the house to take you in. We are in mourning. You see the hair cut, the black robes? Who is it that died? I hope not the children or his old father. Admetus' wife is dead. What are you saying? And he still invited me to stay? He was ashamed to send you away from his house. Oh, I am impressed. What a wife you have lost. 
We are all lost. She's not the only one. But yes, I noticed his eyes wet with tears and his cut hair and his face. But he persuaded me, insisting that it was an outsider that he was burying. And in spite of how I felt, I went in through these doors and I was drinking in the house of a hospitable man who had suffered such a blow. And I was carrying on and putting flowers in my hair. And, and then for you not to tell me when there was so great a tragedy in the house, where is he burying her? Where shall I go to find her? By the straight path that leads to Larissa, you will see a tomb of polished stone outside the city. Oh, heart and hand that have endured so much. Now show what a son, the daughter of Electrion of Tyrans, Alcmene bore to Zeus. For I must rescue the woman who has just died and set her up again in the house Alcestis and do this favor for Admetus. I will go and watch for the black robed Lord of the dead, death. And I think I will find him drinking the offerings beside the tomb. And if I jump out and surprise and catch him, I will fasten my arms around him and there is no one who will release him, struggle as he will, until he gives the woman up to me. But if I miss this prey and he does not come to his bloody feast, I will go down to the sunless halls of Coré and the king and I will plead with them and I am sure that I will bring back Alcestis and put her into the hands of my host who invited me into his house and did not drive me away even though he had been struck by such a heavy blow but he concealed it from me because he is noble and had respect for me. Who is more hospitable than this in all of Thessaly? Who in all of Greece? He will never say that his kindness and bravery were wasted on a cowardly man. Oh, hateful entrance, hateful sight of my widowed halls. Yo, moi, 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 ai, ai, where shall I go? Where stand, what say, and what not? How can I die? Truly it was to an evil fate that my mother bore me. I envy the dead. I am in love with them. I long to live in that house. I take no pleasure in seeing the sunlight nor in setting my foot upon the ground. Such a hostage death has stolen from me and given to Hades. Go on, go on. Go inside the house. Aye, aye. You have suffered anguish worthy of your cries. Uh, uh, you are in pain. I understand perfectly. Whoa, whoa. You are not helping the dead. Oh, my, my, I... Never again to see your dear wife's face is painful. You have reminded me of what broke my heart. What greater evil is there for a man than to lose a faithful wife? If only I had never married and lived with her in our house. I envy people who are unmarried and childless. They have one soul to grieve for, a bearable burden. But children's sicknesses and bridal beds ravaged by deaths are unbearable to see when it is possible to go through life unmarried and childless. Bad luck has come hard to wrestle with. I, I, you said no limit to your grief. Uh, uh, heavy to bear, but still. Whoa. whoa. Courage. You are not the first to have lost. Boy, my, my. A wife. There's some tragedy for all of us morals mortals oh long mourning and grief for loved ones below the earth why did you prevent me from throwing myself into the hollow ditch of the grave and with her to lie dead with my perfect wife hades would have gotten two souls together instead of one most faithful to each other crossing together the underworld lake I had a relative whose son and only child died in his house, a loss worth grieving for, but he bore the tragedy in moderation. 
though he was childless and already his hair was turning gray and he was advanced in years. Oh, frame of the house, how will I enter you? How will I live with the change in fortunes? Boy, boy. So much has happened since. Then, among pine torches from Pelion with wedding songs, I went inside holding my dear wife by the hand and a noisy rebel followed, blessing my dead wife and me. How noble and royal our ancestors on both sides, we were joined together. Now, instead of wedding songs, there is grieving. Instead of white garments, black robes accompany me into the house. Inside, to my empty nest. You have felt your first true grief without any previous experience. But you have saved your own life. Your wife is dead. She left your love. What is new in that? Many men, death has taken away their wives. My friends, I think that my wife's fortune is luckier than mine, although it does not look that way. No grief will ever touch her now. She is famous and her troubles are over. And I, who ought not to be alive, have bypassed my fate and will lead a miserable life. Just now, I understand. How will I endure to enter my house? Whom will I speak to? Who will speak to me and make my coming welcome? Where will I turn? The emptiness inside will drive me out when I see my wife's bed empty and the chairs in which she used to sit and inside the floor is dirty and the children leaning against my knees will weep for their mother and the servants will, warn, will mourn their mistress what a woman has died and gone from the house. That is what it will be like at home. But outside, the marriages of the Thessalians will torment me and parties full of women. For I will never hold up when I see the friends of my wife. Anyone who is my enemy will say this. Look at him, living in shame when he did not dare to die but gave up his wife in cowardice and escaped Hades. Does he even look like a man? And he hates his parents, though he was not willing to die. In addition to my tragedy, this is what people will say. Why is it better for me to live, my friends, when I have a bad reputation and deserve it? I have heard the muses many songs and heard the stories that are told. But I have found only this, nothing is stronger than necessity. For this I have found no cure in the Thracian tablets where the sayings of Orpheus are written down, nor in all the drugs Phoebus gave to the Asclepiads, the proven remedies for other ills of mortals. Futile it is to go to the altar and statue of this goddess who alone of gods ignores our pleadings. Goddess necessity, come upon not me with greater force that you have before. Whatever Zeus assents to by your hand it is done. You forge even the hard cable Lee and iron by force and ignoring the stubborn temper, you break us all. You too, the goddess has taken in the inescapable grip of her hands, but be brave, for you will not ever bring back the dead from the other world by weeping. Even the shadowy children of the gods perish in death. Dear she was when she was with us, dear she will be in death. You brought to your bed the most perfect wife of all. Let not the tomb of your wife be thought of as a mound of the perished dead, but let it be honored like the gods, a holy shrine for travelers. 
and someone turning into the road that angles off will say this. She once died for her husband. Now she is a blessed spirit. Hail mistress, grant my prayer. Such words will greet her. You ought to speak openly to a man who is your friend, Admetus, and not in silence to hold back your troubles inside yourself. I expected to stand by you in your misfortunes and to prove myself a friend. But you did not tell me that it was your wife's body you were laying to rest. And instead, you entertained me in the house as if your worries were for an outsider. And I crowned my head and poured libations to the gods in your unhappy house. I blame you. Yes, I do for this, but I do not want to add to your grief. Now I will tell you why I've come back here again. I want you to take this woman and keep her for me until I come back here driving the Thracian horses after killing the king of the Bastonian. But if I don't, <laughs> no, that won't happen for I shall return. I give you the woman to serve in the house. It was a struggle to get her. I came upon some people setting up a public contest. Well worth the effort for a sportsman. And it's from there I bring her as my prize. I won, you see. For the winners in the lighter contest, the prize was horses. And for those in the greater events, you know, boxing and wrestling, it was cattle. A woman went with them. It would have been a shame to let this fine prize go. But as I say, you must take care of the woman. I did not steal her, but won her by hard work. In time, perhaps you will think well of me for this. It was not because I didn't respect you or considered you less than a friend that I hid my poor wife's death. But it would have been one more pain on top of the pain I already suffered if you had gone to someone else's house. It was enough for me to weep for my loss. But sir, the woman, if it's possible, I beg you, ask another Thessalian to keep her, one who has not suffered what I have. You have many friends in Farai. Do not remind me of my troubles. How could I see her in the house and keep from crying? Do not add more suffering to a sick man, for I'm overwhelmed by my tragedy. Where would a young woman be kept in the house? I see that she is young by her clothing and accessories. Will she stay in the men's quarters? How will she remain intact if she associates with young men? It is not easy, Heracles, to restrain a young man. It is your interest to have it hard in this. Or should I keep her in the dead woman's room? But how could I introduce her into her bed? I fear blame on two counts from the citizens, lest they reproach me from betraying my savior and lying in bed with another young woman and from my dead wife. Well, she deserves my respect. I must be very careful. But you, miss, whoever you are, you are the same size as Alcestis and you look like her. Why am I? In God's name, take her out of my sight, that woman, unless you want to bring down a ruined man. When I look at her, I think I'm looking at my wife. She muddies my heart. My eyes are flooded with tears. Oh, how unhappy I am. Just now I taste the bitter grief. I cannot say that your luck is good, but we must come what may accept the gift of the God. If only I had the power to bring your wife from the halls of the dead into the light and to do you this favor. I know you wish me well, but what good is that? It is not possible for the dead to come into the light. Do not go overboard, but bear up as you must. It's easier to give advice than to bear such a loss. What do you gain if you will be miserable forever? I know that myself, but a kind of love urges me to do this. Oh, to love the dead, that brings a tear to my eye. She destroyed me, and more than I can say. You have lost a good wife. Who will deny it? So that life is no longer a pleasure to me. Time will soften it. Now your trouble is new. You are right in saying time. 
If time means dying, a woman will end it and the desire for a new marriage. Do be quiet. What have you said? I would never think of it. What do you mean? Will you never marry again but remain celibate? There is no one who will lie in my bed. Do you suppose you are helping the dead? I must give her my respect. Fine, fine. But you are being a fool. Maybe. But you will never call me a married man. You are a faithful lover to your wife, and I respect you for it. May I die if I ever betray her, even now that she is gone. Yes, now take this woman inside your noble house. No, I beg you by your father, Zeus. You will be making a mistake if you do not do this. And if I do it, I will stab my heart with grief. Do it. Perhaps the favor will turn out right. Oh, if only you had not won her in that contest. Yes, but when I won, you won with me. Kindly said, but let the woman go away. She will go away if she must, but first see if she must. She must, if you do not want to torture me. I know something too, which makes me so insistent. Have your way, but you know you are causing me a lot of pain. You can thank me later, just do it. Take her in if the house must receive her. I couldn't hand this woman over to servants. You take her into the house yourself, if you wish. I will put her into your hands, no one else's. I will not touch her. You may go into the house. I will release her only to your right hand. Sir, you are forcing me to do something I do not want to. Dare to stretch out your hand and touch the stranger. Yes, I reach out my hand as if to kill a gorgon. Do you have her? I have her. Yes. And keep her now, and you will say that Zeus's son is a brave and good guest. Just look at her. See if she resembles your wife. You are happy now. Give up your grief. Admetus takes the covering off of the woman's face. Oh, gods. What can I say? This is an unexpected miracle. Do I really see my wife? Or does some false joy from God strike to break my heart? No. The woman you see here is your wife. Watch out that it is not a phantom of the dead. I was not some kind of ghoul when you took me in as your guest. But do I really see my wife whom I just buried? You can be sure of that. I'm not surprised that you have your doubts. May I touch her? May I speak to her as my wife alive? Speak to her. You now have all that you wanted. Oh, face and figure of my dearest wife. I have you against all expectation. I never thought I would see you again. You have her. Let's only hope no envy from the gods comes down on us. Oh, noble son of all high Zeus, God bless you and may your father protect you, for you alone have lifted us up. How did you manage to bring her back to life? I fought a battle with the Lord of the Spirits. Where was it you met death in battle? Right beside the tomb. I ambushed him and seized him with my hands. Why does she stand there without speaking? It is not yet allowed for you to hear her speak until she is no longer consecrated to the gods of death when the third day comes. But take her inside and continue to act justly in the future, Admetus, and be pious towards your guests. Goodbye then. I will go now to perform the next labor for the king, the son of Stenelos. Stay with us and be our guest. Another time, but now I must hurry. God bless you and keep you till you make the journey home. I command the citizens and the whole tetrarchy to hold dances for this good fortune and to make all the altars smoke with sacrifice for good luck. Now we change to a better life than before. I must admit that I'm a happy man. 
Many are the forms of the spirit world. Many are the things the gods bring about against all reason and things looked for do not happen after all. Yet a God finds a way for the unexpected. That is how this story has ended. Lights fade. Blackout. Thank you, everyone. I would love to introduce our cast featuring Peter Perelin as Admetus, Samira Camaño as Alcestis, Jay Shogrin as Fairies, Tracy Patton as Chorus One, Allison Quagan Harkin as Chorus Two, Jay Cooney as Her Heracles, Francesca Mintov Chij as Thanatos, Marley Dokes as Apollo and the Servant, Isa Jakowicz as the Maid and Annika Whaley as the children. That is our show. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick five minute break and then return for our discussion led by Dr. Laura Delosier. If you enjoyed tonight's reading, please consider donating. There, are, uh, there is a link in the comments. We'll see you shortly. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone who is um, in the Zoom chat, you can turn on your videos. That includes cast members and um, community members. Everyone, please turn on your videos. Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Noelia Burkett and I had the pleasure of directing tonight's reading. Um, I'd love to just start um, by everyone introducing themselves, um, whatever, uh, so please say your name, uh, your pronouns, and what your connection is to this project, whether you are an actor um, or whether you're a community member watching. So I'll start, I actually should change my name um, in the chat, but my name is Noelia Burkett. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I directed tonight's reading, and I'm the virtual, the director of virtual programming at Relative Theatrics. Um, and I'm just gonna go via who's on my screen. So, um, Allison, we have you next. All right, I'm Allison Quag and Harkin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I was an actor in the production, Chorus 2, and um, I, in my day job, I teach at the University of Wyoming in Gender and Women's Studies and Disability Studies. Fabulous. Thank you. And we have Tracy. Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Owens Patton. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I play Chorus One. And my day job, I am a professor at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Communication and Journalism, and also with the School of Culture, Gender, Social Justice. Fabulous. Next, we have Jay Cooney. Hi, I'm Jay. I use they, them pronouns. I played Heracles, and I think that's it, right? Yeah, and, and what is your role in the relative theater community? I'm the social justice and artistic intern for Relative Theatrics. Woo, amazing. All right, next we have Issa. Hi, my name is Issa. I played the maid in the production um, and I am the marketing and performance intern at Relative Theatrics this next year. Yay. All right, next we have Jay Shogren. Hi, I played fairies. I I'm periodically in relative theatrics when they need a good beard <laughs> and uh, enjoy it thoroughly. Fabulous. All right, next we have Samira. Hi, my name is Samira Camaño. Um, I use uh, she, uh, her pronouns. And I teach chemistry at the community college and have a photography company. And this is my first time with Relative Theatrics. I play Alcestis and the woman. Yay. All right, next we have Peter Perlin. Hi, I'm Peter Perlin. My pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, I've done work with Relative Theatrics for many years and a lot of great productions that I look back on fondly. And this is gonna, this one's gonna join that gallery. So great to be here. Great, thank you. Um, next we have Anne. Hello, hello, I'm Ann Mason. I'm the producing artistic director of Relative Theatrics as well as the founder of the organization. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, this was such a treat. It's really fun for me to be able to be a part of these productions in a little bit more of a viewership role than directly involved. So very happy to have Noelia on board. Thank you. All right, next we have Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Deloge. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the dramaturg and discussion leader for tonight. I work at the University of Wyoming where I get to teach about this stuff, about dead Greeks and Romans in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. Amazing, thank you. Um, and then we have our community members who have joined us. And I apologize, I don't know your name, but your little thing says M. Brown, so. Whoever you yes. are. Yes. Sorry about that. My name is uh, Matt. Uh, Matt Brown. I, I go or use uh, they them pronouns, and I am a uh, history master student at the University of Wyoming, studying American uh, West. Nice to meet you, Matt. All right. Next we have Bailey. Everybody, I'm Bailey Patterson. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am a graduate student in the Department of Communication at the University of Wyoming right now, and teach public speaking to undergrads. 
I think I've been with RT for three years now, something like that, mostly helping with Playwrights Voice. Congratulations to all of you guys tonight. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan. <clears throat> I use he and his pronouns, um, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Wyoming studying secondary English education. Fabulous. Well, thank you all so much. At this point, I would love to transfer the, the proverbial baton over to Dr. Lozier to continue the discussion or start the discussion rather. Thank you, Noelia. Well, first off, I'd like to thank our, our, our wonderful cast and also Alex, our crew, for keeping us going with the technology and Noelia, our director, as well as Ann Mason for having initiated this project of reading uh, Greek plays. And I'd also like to thank uh, Celia Lushnik, our translator, and Diatima for permission to use uh, Celia's beautiful, supple translation of Euripides Alcestis. And we have um, some questions that Jay has supplied us. Um, before, I, I'm happy to answer questions about the original performance of this play in 438 BC at Athens, but I am far more interested in some sense in looking at the ways that this play is still relevant to our problems and concerns. Well, Laura, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Oh no. Here, I'll jump on in for a moment. Um, what, what Laura was saying, and, and hopefully we'll get her internet streaming coming back here pretty soon and figure out those problems. Um, gotta love the new world that we're living in of this Zoom theater and dealing with different technical issues that we haven't really dealt with before. Who knew? Um, anyway, um, what, when Laura comes back, she's uh, just this fountain of knowledge and is going to be able to answer so many questions. And I think she was saying, you know, especially in terms of the original productions of this play in ancient Greece um, and any context there. But we're also really interested in how taking this ancient text and putting it in a modern light, um, or at least delivering it through actors that live in the present day in a modern society, what sticks with us, what changes, um, you know, what, what is reinforced, what has been passed down the line, and, and what are the things that we're maybe um, pushing up against a little bit. Um, but maybe while we're waiting for, for Laura to come back, um, I will also mention to those of you that are watching on Facebook and just checking into this conversation via um, Facebook Live, you can put your chats or your questions into the chat box and we'll make sure that those get read out loud or comments, anything that you wish to share. Um, but at this point, I might turn this over to some of the actors um, just to get some first impressions of, of this piece. Uh, Peter, I'm going to go to you because you've done a few of these with us now, um, but this plays a little bit different. Um, it's, it's not necessarily as tragedy as the rest of them. So I'm curious about how you first entered into this play and what your first impressions were. I, I love that it, it's, not a, it's not totally a tragedy. And, and of course, Admetus thinks it's a tragedy for a long while, but then there's the, there's the flip at the end. And you know, I work on Shakespeare and it reminded me a lot of Shakespeare's Winter's Tale where the statue, the, Leontes loses his wife Hermione, she comes back to life at the end of the play. Um, and that's called a tragic comedy. So I, I mean, that's one of the ways people talk about those plays. And so I thought about Alcestis as kind of that way too, in that it gives the audience something very lovely at the end. And maybe that an audience didn't see coming um, but it, wow, it, you emotionally for my character, talk about, you know, turning on a dime. It's, <laughs> it's crazy, but very, very fun. Yeah, I, lo I love that you mentioned that this idea of like a tragic comedy, because I also think that in, in sort of the contemporary realm of theater, we no longer fully live in the like, this play is strictly a comedy, this play is strictly a drama. So often they are, at least what we do at Relative Theatrics, 
very heavy pieces, very hard hitting or have these, these moments of darkness or, or depth or, or despair. And the, the comedy then almost exemplifies that or, or expands that experience. It is a bigger range, a bigger spectrum. Um, yeah, and we'll have to ask Laura when she comes back, are there, are there any other Greek tragedies that pull a number like this? I mean, you'd, you'd have your day of Greek tragedies, three plays at the festival followed by, followed by a play that said, I'm a satyr play, I'm a, I'm a travesty of comic travesty of everything that you've seen earlier, but the, the tragedies themselves stuck to being tragedies. Right. Noelia, you were involved also in the um, reading and discussion with our partner for this program, Reading Great Tragedy Online from the Center of Hellenic Studies at Harvard University, Cosmo Society, and Out of Chaos Theater, um, getting to play uh, Death, which was very fun to watch. And there were some kind of wildish, uh, like outlandish choices that Paulo Mahoney made with, with yesterday's reading. How, um, how did you sort of navigate both of these at the same time? Yeah, um, it's interesting because you wanna, you know, you're doing the same show or excerpts from the same show, but you wanna have your own sort of artistic input on it. And so Paul is um, a brilliant director and he sort of um, said that yesterday, for yesterday's rehearsal that, or yesterday's performance that, it was like these big ca characters got together for a tailgate and then all <laughs> were sort of centered around this event, which I thought was a really great thing. And I think that there are things that overlap. The um, Heracles yesterday was quite a big character and Jay Cooney did a wonderful job of portraying um, uh, Heracles as this larger than life character, but quite different. Jay went today, sort of went with the drunken life of the party, whereas yesterday, um, that the actor who played their Heracles um, did it as sort of uh, the drunken life of the party, whereas, oh, I'm hearing an echo somewhere, I don't know. Um, anyway, so um, I think Paul and I discussed, but um, at the end of the day, it, I think since we were doing the full, full text, um, it was more important to me that the words actually came out than making these really big outlandish choices. Um, and so we focused more on that than, you know, while still peppering in elements of fun, but uh, yeah. Welcome back, Laura, you're here. Sorry about that. Obviously I offended some God of the unknown. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> I'll need to do some sacrifices to propitiate them. Um, well, thank you for, for carrying on. We have some social justice questions that there was one I thought would be a, a good way to start off because I can see even on um, Facebook, we have a question about, about this interesting dynamic between Alcestis and Enmetus. So this play, uh, as the, our information on relative theatrics suggested, this play is a very peculiar, unusual play. And I keep saying play very deliberately. You can call it a tragedy, but it was slotted in the fourth position when it was performed. And that fourth position is traditionally for something that we call today a satyr play. In other words, it was for a, a performance that was clearly meant to be comic, to, to have the audience rolling in the aisles. So we have instead this play, which when it begins off does not quite seem to be going there, although we do have information from Apollo warning us in a way that pretty much everyone in the original audience would immediately realize, oh my God, Heracles is finally gonna show up before the end of this performance. So they're, they're waiting in sense for that. So the question I wanna start with is in a time in a society where patriarchy was the law, we see Admetus honor the request from Alcestis to never marry again, or at least I'll say to, to make a promise not to remarry again. So how does the matriarch Alcestis in this context challenge the previously unchallenged male values? And I was wondering if there was maybe someone in the, the cast who wanted to start off with an idea about that. I'll just say that playing Admetus, um, I felt the 
power of um, Alcestis's words, where she's in the driver's seat because of the decision that she has made. And she makes very sure that not only I, but everybody around me knows it. And um, that's that my character's he's feeling very circumscribed and it was really, really interesting to play. So that's just an opening gambit on that rich question. And it's interesting that she can only do that when she is leaving the world of sunlight. That's the only time she has that power. And as soon as she's gone, well, he he lapses a little bit, you know, but uh, he has his reasons for doing it. And I found, um, I just love the chorus in this too, because they have something to say about it. Uh, I think they reflect on the patriarchal society. You know, I loved it where Chorus 2 says, I hope she realizes that she is dying gloriously and is by far the best life under the sun because she's doing that. You know, that I could see that being a time when there was a, a kind of a laugh of recognition of something or other, you know, that was of, of what was going on and uh, a reminder of the lack of any kind of legal status that women had, for example. And I think your role was one of the more difficult ones in the play, in fact, because you, uh, you're a very dramatic individual, you have all the legal rights, you have all the power, and yet when it comes right down to it, what is it all worth? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you do feel that, uh, you do feel the, the the power of her words as she's leaving you. Yeah, and I, one thing that I thought I noticed um, in Admetus is that, and, and I took this to mean that he doesn't like that somebody else in, in the scenario has power, is that in his scene with Alcestis, he keeps saying, hey, I'm suffering too, you're leaving us. How am I, how am I? It's, it's almost like he's trying to get some negotiating power back um, or at least a little moral stature back that we're really suffering because you are leaving us. I think it's a little bit warped what he's trying to do, a lot warped what he's trying to do, but it felt very, very much like he is not wanting to give that ground of privilege that he's very used to occupying. I Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Samira if when you were when you were determining how you wanted to play Alcestis, do you feel that she's pushing against a great force, or do you feel that she she's within, in some sense, that power structure as a queen? I was curious where you felt. Was she, does she have a firm footing within it, or um, even though a queen, she still a female within that society. Um, it felt to me that there is a special dynamic there happening between her and Admetus that allows her to, in that moment, take that stance. Mm -hmm. um, almost like there is this agreement of the place of the woman in the society and she's played it and okay, so now it's my turn to ask this one person that I have this understanding with for what I want after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought it was very interesting how she, she's not asking it as a selfish request for herself, but she makes sure to, um, she has the reasoning behind it, you know, like my daughter, um, I fear for what's gonna happen if another woman takes my place. And um, I thought that that was maybe a glimpse of, if it would have been a more, a, equal society, she wouldn't have need that reason. She could have just asked it as her, you know, dying wish. I was also curious, Isa, as the maid, how you felt within that power dynamic of the household? I thought that the one of the interesting things that she had to say was about the fact that, da, 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 scrolling back up to the top, um, I, the admiration that the maid has and the fact that she talks about all of the servants were crying, everyone in the house feeling sorry for their mistress, but she held out her right hand to each and no one was so low that she did not speak to him or hear what he had to say. And in that way, the way that she shows her love for everyone, 
in a way and she respects other people and I'm just speaking to her character as a human being. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was interesting. Tracy, you're representing with Allison um, a course which in origin would have been played by Athenian citizens, maybe 15 to 50 folk. So you, you have a bunch of viewpoints that you're representing. You're the community watching this. And I was curious, um, we've heard from Allison how she thought. I was wondering, you as the, the other half of that community, what were some thoughts you had in response to this household's events and the dynamics you're witnessing happening within them? Well, may I say, I loved playing this role because I felt like the nosy neighbor that we all know, where I kind of had a foot in every place and saying, oh, this is happening. And I mean, let's be honest, Admetus had tons of feelings that needed to be in check. There wasn't an emotion he didn't feel. And so it was great to kind of try to hold his line, tell him he hasn't suffered the most, yell at the dad, and then narrate the whole way through for the rest of the people. I felt like I was someone who was like, oh, you just came in the middle of the movie. Well, here's what's happened. And so I really liked that, that part in, I thought it was really powerful that it was two women who have been cast to play that role since I too teach parts of the Greek antiquity as it relates to speech. And so while this is not a speech, it is saying volumes about who gets to speak and in what body and when and where. And I, I found it very thrilling. Well, how about the father-in-law in this case, Ferries? Any thoughts, Jay, about where you fit as a father-in-law, we'll come to the father in a bit, but as a father-in-law in relationship to this woman who has just died or how she fits within the household that you've given over to your son. Yeah, I thought I, thought I raised him better than that. <laughs> okay. Um, in what way? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, when it's your time, it's your time. You don't to talk your wife into doing it for you. I mean, I thought that was just, I, I, I did a better job than that, I thought. So I was pretty disappointed in his uh, cowardice, coward, cowardly behavior. And uh, at, at the same time, I guess I respected his ability to talk somebody else into dying for him. That was a pretty good trick. I hope that uh, you picked up some business savvy from me, I guess. But um, in general, I was pretty disappointed that that's who he picked, his wife. Uh, that just seemed a little bit low on the, uh, low on the morality scale. Did you look at it at all? when you were thinking about your character and how you fit into the, to the, even the scenes that you weren't in, were you thinking at all about Alcestis in and of herself? Because it's interesting that so far the way you're discussing it, it's, it's more the relationship with your biological child and, and this woman who, as she's interestingly referred to so many times in the play, the stranger who's a part of of your house because she's not your blood relation. Was there anything admirable in her actions since technically she volunteered to do it? Yeah, I guess that didn't really come through. Um, I mean, I was in a way defending her by saying, you know, you're kind of a jerk for doing this, but I'm not sure if I was defending her or if I was just saying, you're a jerk for doing this. And it could have been anybody, could have been a servant. And I still would have seemed to have that reaction. Maybe not though, it just, I, it depends on how regal my red is, you know? I mean, I might've mm -hmm. said, well, you could have paid somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't count if you pay them to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's that was that's not quite clear. It's just you have to find someone. That's about all we're given, and that's an interesting thought. Yeah, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure how much you know. 
how much uh, he connected with her, you know, before that. I'm not sure if he, that I didn't get really a, a super sense of that there was a real strong bond between him and the, and the daughter-in-law. Well, that's a great segue to a question we have from an audience member. Jan James was asking um, and asking Peter, and uh, was your character really sincere? You know, Admetus, is he really sincere about his lament for his wife or was he just regretting the damage to his reputation? Um, that's a great question. Because he, I, so before I answer it, I just would say that I missed um, when you do these Zoom readings, you have one, we do one rehearsal together and then, and then we do the performance. You work a little bit on, on your own, you make your choices. But when you're doing a production that you put up on its feet for an audience, you're spending a lot of time in the rehearsal hall and you explore precisely questions like that. And what you think the answer is on day one might or might not be the answer that you come up with when you get through the rehearsal process. So all this is to say, anything that I would answer is just me on pretty much on day one. But I, I, um, I read it that he's undergoing a re that he's th yes that he's he's serious in his lament. For me, there's a difference before she dies and after he dies. Um, mm -hmm. That he it's it's all theoretical for him before. He, she dies. Um, she, I mean, he doesn't want her to die. This seems like it's getting out of control. Um, but in, obviously it's a bad thing, but where, what really kicks in for him is when he goes to put her body on the pyre and comes back to the house, that last sequence for, for the way I was reading it. Wow. He has, he, at that point has recognized through experience what it means to have loss mm -hmm. and that it's sh that it's very shattering um you know if if we all worked on this play together for f five weeks in the rehearsal hall maybe uh, we'd find something different there but that was i i took it to be straight up yep he's he's it's a tragedy for him a true tragedy mm -hmm. samira did you have any thoughts on that Um, I was pretty struck by, um, I don't have the script in front of me anymore, but when he essentially realizes the mistake he made, mm -hmm. um, I, I have a feeling that when he, um, gets his wife to die for him, he sees it as a good thing. Like somehow he's, he's winning or he's mm -hmm. saving himself from something, but then he comes to realize that. Now he's left with all the grief and the children to raise mm -hmm. and the reputation. And so maybe he trade a hard spot for a harder spot. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see his transition happen um, in terms of, I, I don't think he was being insincere in the beginning, but I think like Peter says, he was more of a going through the motions of, oh, my wife is gonna die. Um, but then at one point, he actually does realize the pain that's coming from this deal. And I think I, I felt it as sincere um, from that point on. And, and it's, a lot, it's a lot bigger than I think anybody expected it to be, yeah. the, the grief he's gone through. But there's no, there's no doubt too that he is like, he's in massive denial about his own culpability. That scene with his father isn't, <laughs> I loved it, but it's insane, right? That's an insane scene. And I loved the way that you played it, um, Jay, just by just by looking at your son like, you're an idiot. You think I'm, I'm not supposed to die for you? And it's right after that scene that we have a special lament that is put into the, into the play where I think you can see how Admetus is, is recognizing some of his culpability. And I was wondering if anyone else in the cast or particularly like Allison or Tracy, because you have parts in that lament, it's a, it's a, it's a special kind of mm, choral passage, if you want to call it that, where the chorus gets to join with an actor, in, in this case, um, a dirge for the departed wife. But 
there's kind of a contrast between what Admetus is doing and what you guys were doing. Yeah, I think that was one of my favorite parts as well of, of the tragedy. I kind of think of it as a comedy because you get to see the arc of the character and there were some really funny moments. And as part of the chorus, if we're representing the community, you know, it's kind of a, a cheeky moment, if you will, because here's this guy who's so arrogant, who has everything, every privilege, and he thinks he's the most disprivileged person who's had the only person on earth who's had struggles, problems, and death. And you get to see where you're making fun of him, maybe a little bit like, yes, yes, go on. You know, we all suffer. But then as time goes on and he starts that self-reflection process, which really happens with, I think, with his conversations in part with Hercules, mm -hmm. then you get to see and go, ah, oh, there's the character turn. There's where we really see that he actually loved his wife because in Greek society, it really isn't ever clear since women really don't matter. You know, we're the vessels for birthing babies, you know, and if you can't do that, then why exist? And so it was really interesting to see that arc. And so I really, I liked seeing that because as a chorus, I think we were able to develop our own characters as well from being like, ah, look at the schmo and schmuck to, ah, maybe this is a little tragic because we felt for her, the woman. We never felt for him, I think, until that turning point. Allison? Yeah, and I, um, I think that's a very important scene too because the, the chorus is a little bit, uh, you know, they're talking about moderation. They are thinking about the state, not just about his own personal grief. Hey, you're the king here. There are a lot of other people you're responsible for. You need to deal with this. We have to get things back on an even keel in a way. We have to keep things going for everybody here. It's not just you, pal, although they don't come right out and say that. So yes, and it's, I thought it's, I really like too that we we did have kind of amusing characters to play there the, the know-it-all old man you know <laughs> we know people like this or oh gosh he's just going over the top come on stop with the oi 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 ah, ah stuff <laughs> <laughs> but it's it really is trying to remind him of his duties I think to everyone you can't spend the rest of your life crying here you have to get back on the throne and get busy so um yeah and i think it's done in a kind of subtle and rather amusing way and i think that's a good um a good point to transition to another question i had and in particular if any of our 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 folks joining us on this conversation would like to jump in please feel free to do so so traditionally and even at the beginning of this play from Apollo, we are clearly told that Admetus is famous for his hospitality, <laughs> that um, he is the, the person who is remembered most for that particular kind of virtue to the extent that he would accept Heracles, a guest, into his house, even though he has to bury his own wife and the mother of his children. But that doesn't mean Admetus is a paragon of all virtues. And so I was curious to what extent in this play is humor being derived or at least communication being had about um, his particular place in the society by perhaps suggestions or outright statements about other things that he doesn't get quite as perfect as his hospitality. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that that's that he um, he he makes this essential virtue, non-negotiable virtue, out of mm -hmm. hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, it's one. It's it's not as big a deal to have his wife die for him as it would mm -hmm. be to have somebody turned away from his front door. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I don't know what to say, what really to say about that irony. I think that's a, you know, that's a, 
hospitality, I think, is a virtue, but it is, it's like the virtue for him. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, that's there, yeah, it prevents him maybe from, from understanding where true value lies because his house has been this really hospitable place before um, where he's lived with his wife. But afterwards, when she's gone, it, it's all hollow, right? It's um, so, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm spitballing here, but others jump in. I, I do have to just jump in and say that it's very funny to me that um, Peter is, for those of you who don't know him, Peter is extremely well known for his hospitality as a person. Um, and he has these wonderful parties at his home. And so um, I wasn't thinking about that when I offered you the role, Peter, but it is sort of art imitates life, I have yes. to say. Listen, I, it, it, I got it when he said, it doesn't matter how bad I'm feeling, I am not turning somebody away from my house. That, may, that did make sense for me, um, even though within the context of, you know, then you have to go, oh, is, is that, should that be the first and primary value? I don't know, but I certainly yes. can. He's also unaware of the, the pain that everyone else in the household is going through. That doesn't matter, especially the servants who, they can't even go to the graveside because they have to uh, feed and uh, give drinks to this out of control guest. And that's just fine. That never occurs to him. And I, that I think really tells us something about what the society and culture were like there. And I think that's very important too. And I mean, that's a great scene with Heracles, but it's also really, wrenching with the servant who is yeah. suffering yeah. and trying not to reveal it and then just comes out and says you know what yeah. this has happened mm -hmm. and you need to know about it yeah so i think it speaks exactly to where servants fit in that society as well as women mm -hmm. where i think the world would have stopped had it been a man of prominence but because it's the wife he's still at her death cares more about his ethos his character for being known as hospitable yeah yeah okay. it's, oh. it's interesting just to as 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 um allison is pointing out like hospitality is a great virtue but he doesn't he seems to think he owns that hospitality as opposed to this hospitality is made possible by the collective labor and the disproportionately large labor that falls on the servants in the household but he owns it i and wish Harley was still with us yeah. she, she had to take off but I, I would have loved to get her perspective on this but i mean it's so true going back to what tracy said just sort of about the social hierarchy of this society i was reading um I was reading Cassandra a while back, this really wonderful novel that Laura and I have talked about a lot. And there's some essays um, attached to it as well. And Krista Wolf, the, the author, quoted Aristotle's Poetics in one, where Aristotle basically lays it out, saying that the men are the rulers, that the women are below them, and that the slaves are barely human essentially. Like that was how Aristotle laid it out. And I just, I was taken so aback from reading that because this is something like poetics is something that has informed all of my foundational training in theater, my formative knowledge of how to analyze plays. And I hadn't even realized like the society which, in which this was coming from. There are two lines I think which speak to this this point, which are very interesting. One is what Issa mentioned with her character, the maid. And it's interesting, these lines come sort of at the beginning, somewhat at the beginning and somewhat at the end. Issa's maid made the comment that Alcestis before she dies has gone around to all the servants. And by servant, just hear the word slave, because that's most likely who these people are. They are owned, could be owned by Alcestis, but ten, they should. the majority of them will be actually the property of Admetus. Um, the, in other words, Alcestis could have brought some as part of her wedding dower, but the majority are going to be, and even if she brought some, they're under her husband um, authority within the household. But the point is Alcestis went around to all the servants and said goodbye to every servant. And then when we get to Marley's role um, as the servant who, 
may or may not be joined by anyone else, but at least that one servant's been left behind or slave has been left behind to take care of Heracles and says about how I as a servant or slave want to mourn this woman because this woman is the one who saved us from beatings. There's a line there about saved our skin many a time. And the implication is that it would be someone in the household beating them and the person who would have had that authority would have been Admetus. So it's interesting, part of his hospitality is it lays literally on the skin of the bodies of those servants. And I think there, those, two, those two expressions toward the end, beginning and the end are a good reminder of of what's underpinning um, this value that he has within his household. Were there, were there any questions from the folks who are joining us on this conversation? Yeah, I was just like, I've, what I've been thinking about as I watched this play the other day on Tuesday and I got to watch uh, Noelia's reading yesterday, something that's been just going over and over in my own head and apologies, I did join a little late, so I'm sorry if we talked about this, but just who is the protagonist of this show, you know, and, and who do we as an, as an audience member, you know, are, who are we supposed to be connecting with? Because I remember on my first reading, it seems strange to me, and maybe this is like we're talking about the context of when the show was written, but mm -hmm. it seems strange to me that Admetus is called out, you know, quite fairly for his own his own flaws and everything, and yet at the end he still gets essentially everything he wanted. So, yeah, that's a part of the the continuing debate about this play. Even even in the manuscript tradition where you have commentary in the side, there's there there's a scolion that that. Um, has survived with it that mentions this is a very weird kind of combination of elements in this play. The play as um, particularly those who look at feminist readings will, will mention, look, the play is called Alcestis, but it's Admetus who's on stage for the majority of this play and who seems to be the one whose behavior is most in, in question for the play. And um, that's part of the debate about it is what are we supposed to be looking at? We, we assume because this play was put in as the fourth play, the play that traditionally is supposed to have a happier ending, um, bring laughter to the audience, that that helps explain. But even though there are comic elements in it, that does not certainly preclude in Athenian theater for uh, authors to be questioning things that are happening within their society. And um, this play, well, this play was part of a tetralogy, part of three tragedies and this play, which won second place out of the three authors that were competing, Sophocles, once again, beat Euripides. Euripides does not win first place very often um, in, in his lifetime. And he did win once after he was dead. But for, for this particular play, something about it appealed to the 10 judges that they were willing to at least not say it came in last place. Um, but it's, it seems to have been the, uh, possibly an innovation on Euripides um, doings, but it's a little bit hard sometimes to judge how innovative it is when so few things have actually survived and so few of the actual satyr plays that have survived. There's one fully extent or almost fully extent version of a satyr play. So that's part of, that's part of the question that it's really hard to answer. And it's sort of what, what do you think by looking at the play? Did you have any idea, Justin, or thought on that? Well, I, I mean, I think, I do think that Alcestis is the, I would say that she is the protagonist or, you know, the, the person that we are supposed to say, oh, okay, you, you are the only character, you know, who is done right by everybody all the entire time and, and all of that. So I, I'd say her, you know, and I, I remember I was quite surprised that, you know, she's, she's, she's gone so, so early. And we, and even when she does come back at the end, we don't, of course, hear her talk. She doesn't have any lines or anything like that, but I do think that she is. That's my opinion. The, at the end, I'd just like to say, technically that's, uh, or well, that's a technical problem or which may or may not be being exploited for humor in the play. When this play was first performed in 438 BC, there, was on, there were only two speaking actors. So in fact, the actor who was playing Alcestis, that that part in the play is playing Heracles. So this mute, person comes on and literally cannot speak because that's just the convention but you can you can think of how it could be exploited what if the actor who was playing it um looked nothing like the original actor who was playing the first Alcestis it's true 
that they're switching masks, which enabled them to switch between characters. But you you can imagine how 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 this could be played with, and it does seem that there Euripides is having a little fun with this. Oh yeah, she can't talk. She can't talk because she can't talk. Literally, that's the convention. And the whole thing about three days. Yes, there's there's a religious um, a connection there. But you could also say that, uh, that that maybe that this is the person who's been hired to do all the mute performances for the three days that there are tragedies. I sometimes wonder if there's like an in-joke there too. Yeah. So for the next three days, this one's not talking. But then when the festival's over, this person can talk again. Um, so um, I think I think that's a, a, a an interesting point to bring in. But it does then leave that question of what's the first thing Alcestis is going to say when she finally gets to talk to her wife uh, or to her husband, right, in that particular um, circumstance, and I don't know if that's where someone wants to go, but we do have a, another question um, from Jan James, which connects in with what we're seeing. Although we did see the shift in Edmetus's sincere grief for the loss of his wife, he did not have much growth as an individual in that he remained narcissistic. Everything was about him. A noble ruler should put others' needs above his or her own, should they not? Uh, and so um, I was wondering some thoughts on that. Are his promises, for example, to Alcestis sincere promises? There's a lot of promises that she that he makes, far more than what she initially asked. My thought on this is that he means them in the moment. He absolutely means them in the moment. And he's one of these people who is absolutely sincere in what he's saying and then it's gone and then he's distracted and sincere in the next thing that he sees. Um, I feel like we all know people like this and my personal opinion is is that Al uh, Admetus is one of these people, but I don't know. I mean, Peter, do you have thoughts or do other people have thoughts about this? As his father, I thought, I, I thought he was totally insincere. Mm. I thought he was just covering his ass and whoop. Hi there, Artie. <laughs> and um, I thought he was just, I, I was like, no, no, I, I raised you better than this. This is, what, what is this BS? This is, you're just tap dancing past the, whistling past the graveyard here and uh, stand up and for yourself. So I, I didn't, I, I, I was more skeptical about the whole uh, sincerity thing. I was like, oh, crocodile tears, boo hoo. Well, he does. He has a vested interest in making everybody think it's it's sincere, right? Yes, Which blocks everybody from thinking and seeing what they think and see about his behavior. He does reckon, you know, he does have that moment late in the play where he says, um, "I am going to live a miserable life. In addition to everything I've lost, people will now say he's a coward. Mm -hmm. He let his wife die for him." He, uh, he hates his parents, he's not a good man. And, um, you know, I, he's still gonna be fine. He's a king in, you know, or in, in, in this Greek, he's a ruler in ancient Greece, he's gonna be fine. Um, so I don't, I, I, I don't mean to, to um, ask us to feel too sorry for him, but I did, I did see some signs that He's learning now. How does a does a lesson stick? Who knows? Because she, a god, brings her back to him, so he doesn't have to worry about it. But uh, Heracles actually gets another woman in the house. He's getting another woman in the house before, um, you know. Admetus is like, oh well, you know, if you're gonna force me to take a beautiful young woman into the house, I'm, so, you know, you know, everybody knows that I'm saying I don't want to do it. What's that going to be like? Two weeks from now, if it's if it's not Alcestis, if maybe Noelia's theory kicks in at that point. Well, but I but I also I, I want to argue that I mean pre this show, I feel like Admetus says I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, so I'm gonna have somebody else take my place. He's yeah. not thinking about. He's just feeling in that moment, you know, this fear. I don't want to be the one that dies. Right. So then his wife is like, oh, I'll take your place. And it's like the first, it's it's the last person, you know, he asks his old parents, he asks other people first, but his wife says yes. And I think in that moment, and maybe Laura, you can speak to whether this is accurate or not, but just from an artistic perspective, I'm like, he's like, okay, good. I just want to solve this problem because I'm feeling uncomfortable here. And then he is feeling horrible later. Like, oh, I don't, I know, ah, ah, ah. Now it's this huge mistake, but. 
then it's too late. And then, yeah, now he has to deal with all this stuff. And then, I don't know. Anyway, these are just my thoughts. Yeah, there's, there's a question that gets debated in contemporary scholarship about whether once, once someone has volunteered, and in this case, it's his wife, whether you can stop that. And, and in folktale motif, the answer is usually no, it just has to run and play out. And he, Admetus, lucks out in that Heracles will come. That's at least the version that Euripides gives us. There's another version uh, in Plato's Symposium, which suggests that the reason why Alcestis will come back from the dead is she will go all the way down to the underworld and it will be the gods who send her back up because they judge her love to have been this pure um, love that was stronger than the love and the affection of his parents for him that she took their place and that and that she should be rewarded for this incredible sacrifice uh, on that she did on behalf of her husband and that that's why she gets sent back up um, that it's not that someone has to do it for her in the sense of Heracles physically wrestling with death, but that Alcestis in her own person merits this reward from the gods. Well, then I would argue that, I mean, just to, to go back, I, I already believe that Alcestis is the protagonist of this, but if mm -hmm. that is the history behind it, then I would doubly uh, mm -hmm. argue that she's the protagonist. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. It is something that Euripides is known for, that he he liked, uh, well, there, there's a quote in Aristotle about he's the most tragic of the, the three great um, uh, tragedians, but also he's known for being one who was willing to, to take the thing, well, Aristophanes could critique would be he takes stuff that should happen inside a house and he puts it on the stage. That is, he likes to bring women outside of the household, which yeah, in fifth century BC, Athens, for an elite woman, she should normally be inside the household. Um, she doesn't have to go to the market to purchase things, relying on a husband to do that, for example, relying on slaves that are sent out to, to get things. But she can leave the house for religious occasions with certain certain restrictions. Interestingly, one of them on what role women can have in mourning, because before the foundation of the Athenian democracy, they had a very large, prominent role that would be quite expressive, showing the wealth and status of the household. And that has been curtailed by legislation to, to limit ostentatious display, particularly by elite females. Um, so it's interesting that this play, in some senses, is dovetailing into that kind of an initial uh, um, questions about what roles women can still have under Athenian democracy at the at the time of its first performance. But you could also ask today about questions of where these individuals would fit into our society. Um, one of the questions maybe to lead on with is this this question of letting your parents die for you. It's very hard for me to hear you performing this play today and to, to not, yes, hear generational arguments, the okay boomer retort, but perhaps more pertinently, the, the questions during the pandemic that you will hear at times about whether or not an older generation should sacrifice themselves for the economic vitality of younger members of their family. And I was wondering if, anyone was hearing that or what kind of thoughts they had you know is it a fair question there um that i really want to hear jay's thoughts on this just because of his particular research regarding the quality or the value of a life and how that plays into responses mm -hmm. to the pandemic might toss this at you jay sure um so the, the value of statistical life is 10 million dollars in the united states so if the federal government is assessing the risks of COVID or whatever the risks are, they use approximately $10 million times however many people they think are gonna die. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how young you are, doesn't matter anything else. It's one number uniform across. And so uh, thinking about the big debates on uh, how can people make that sort of judgment, um, shouldn't we adjust for old folks and uh, you know shave that in half because I mean they've had a good time you know they're on their way out uh, blah 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 
And so it's actually pretty, pretty lively debate um, to get into the middle of what, it, what does it mean to uh, put your grandparents on the ice floe and which is what exactly we're talking about, you know, when the Lieutenant Governor of Texas says, you know, let's get to work. I'd die to maintain the freedom to get back to work. Or the governor of uh, Arizona or the governor of Florida does the same thing. They're essentially making that choice. And uh, I guess at least in this play, the uh, the older folks weren't so happy to get on the ice floe. <laughs> Whatever price you put on our heads. I actually have a question to kind of curtail off of that. Mm -hmm. And it, and it comes in, in the dialogue and it was just a line that, that popped out on me. I think it was the father-in-law that said it. It might've been one of the chorus members. I don't remember, but it said, uh, nothing is as strong as necessity. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask like the cast members and the producers and directors to say, to like hear what their thoughts of like what necessity was in terms of, is it land, is it mortality? There, there's, it seems like there's some conflicting things in, in both our society contemporary wise and then also just throughout the play as well. I would, I mean, I don't know, but I would start off by arguing that um, necessity um, is shrouded in many things, whether it be, you know, um, livelihood or, or land or any of these sort of things that you can quantify. Um, but I would argue that what it really comes down to is class and reputation. Um, and so that's the necessity in my mind is that people think well of you. People think that you are a good person. People s will say good things about you after you're gone while you're living. Um, I don't know, does anybody have a different perspective on that? I can, I can add that necessity, Ananke, is um, a personification, a, a, a divine force. Uh, to the to the people who who wrote and first performed and watched this particular play, so it's just it's just not a, a basic term. They do do look at it as something that is controlling your life. This is perhaps a little bit off subject, but um, I'm teaching an acting class right now. And one of the scenes is from this play called Immortality, um, which is about, you know, getting, um, you know, this made up um, study done and so that people can not live forever, but um, that their mm, genes can be manipulated. And so one of the characters says, you know, well, we can get this funded by Big Pharma. Um, because these Texas oil guys have something that that nobody else has, they or that that everybody else has, they have mortality, um, and that that's this thing is that they're not afraid of dying, but they want to to make it as good as they can until the end. Um, everybody knows they're going to die, but but how can you preserve yourself after death? How can you make yourself uh, bigger after death? Yeah, which is, and I, actually that's one of my favorite lines, uh, just the exact opposite of that from uh, Jay's character, where him and Peter are really getting into it. And he says something like, oh, well, this is how people are going to think of you after you die. And uh, the father is like, oh, well, I couldn't care less about what people are going to think of me after I die. It's all about now and living, you know, here and making the what we have here. So That's really interesting also, just in thinking about some of the other pieces that we have done um, or that with the Reading Great Tragedy Online or that Relative Theatrics has done. I mean, I think about Ajax and, and it's, or I think about any of the warriors in the Iliad and it's all about, you know, what, what legacy they will leave, what, what like, like heroic deed they can accomplish that will give them glory to take them on into 
uh, the afterlife essentially to live on forever. And I don't know, I mean, like Peter, um, his computer ran out of battery, so he had to leave us. And I, I, I lament that because I would ask him right now, I would say like, is part of the reason that you want somebody else to die for you because you don't think that you've accrued that glory? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, I'm Laura, have you had conversations well, about this? Well, I can say it's, you know, it's interesting. It's never mentioned I don't recall it ever being mentioned anywhere in this play. And Midas is one of the Argonauts. So he's been on the voyage with Jason, uh, which is part of the reason why he knows Heracles, because Heracles was there, at least at the beginning, before he went off on his own. But but the point is, is he's he's been part of, the, well, according to some traditions, the very first great sailing of a ship, which there were ships before that. But, but the point is, mythically, it might be the very first one. At least it's the great first adventure into the unknown, to the edges of the world, where there be dragons, because you're going to Georgia, um, uh, uh, the country, uh, uh, up by in the Black Sea to the east, um, coast of it. And so he's been on that great voyage. He's the generation before the Trojan War. He will produce a son who according to traditions will go to the Trojan War, take um, men from the kingdom and will fight in it. So, so he's got that, I guess I'm gonna say, as, as part of his background to rely on. And it's interesting that that's not really being exploited as far as I can tell in this play for Aeneas. I don't see him ever falling back on it. Um, and instead it's, it's the conversation with his father and then into that special lament with the chorus, which suggests that he has now become even more concerned about his, his reputation, presumably among his own people as well as within all those men that he went, there were some like 50 some people on that ship. So there, he has a, a wide circle of of other elite men in this mythical heroic age that he's connected with and that he's measuring himself against. We had a question that I think might fit nicely here and it it was asking really about casting choices so this can maybe bring in um, both Noelia and members of the cast. Historically, uh, the, the Greek plays starred cisgendered men in just about every role, even those meant to portray cisgendered females. So how am I uh, a, a, a person of color, indigenous or black person or gender bent portrayal impact this story and its morals? And indeed, when it was first performed, certainly the whole chorus would have been Athenian citizens. The actors were still likely just Athenian citizens, although there's been a special prize instituted for actors. So it's starting to become, um, let's say a, a profession where there are folks doing a circuit. So how maybe did you as either the director or members of the cast, how are you affected by it being you being selected or by a particular other person being selected for that role since nobody in this play is, is a fifth century BC Athenian? I can start off a little bit um, in that um, Jay, who also had to jet out, uh, who's our social justice intern, and I had chatted a little bit about, um, you know, power structures in this, but Mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting to cast um, a person of color as Alcestis in that uh, sort of the typical power structure is that you would have a a white person saying, you know, a white person and a white person. Um, But if there was a power dynamic, I think normally um, maybe a a white person would have the power, well, would have the power in the situation. And so I thought it was an interesting choice to have um, a person of color playing Alcestis, who is this measured, strong, selfless person and who also never blames Admetus for anything, never says, oh, you're so wrong for making me um, die, just is incredibly selfless and lovely. And so I thought that that sort of uh, power dynamic would be really interesting with a person of color. Um, So I think that's sort of my initial thought. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Dr. Patton, I'd be really interested to hear from you about, and you sort of have already touched about what it means to 
play a chorus, right? The community, a mass of people. Did you make any specific choices, not only as a woman, but a woman of color, um, as uh, someone representing the masses in this way? I don't know if I made any conscious choice to say I'm representing, but I went in to the play. I think I read it with the voices of BIPOC and Black Lives Matters. I, I just can't help it. But also because I teach part of Greek antiquity, what everyone forgets is because it's just the Western society. The people who taught the Greeks were Africans. The African Athens came before the Greek Athens. And so I thought that I was bringing some of those folks with me, but it wasn't an intentionality because I cannot not make it so. I am a mixed race, tri-racial brown woman, and I just brought that to the role, I think, naturally because of who I am. You know, usually whenever I've been cast in, I'm a dancer, and the roles in which I played to dance, if I'm the lead, I've never been the person who's the sought after princess. I've always been the wicked queen. And I've been dancing since I was five. So I thought that there were conscious choices I put on people like Noelia and Anne, even if that wasn't true, I put that, I put that social justice lens on them. And I thought, good on them to try to bring something from fifth century BC forward and as we embody all of these different isms and bodies as actors I thought there were parts of the play the tragedy that just don't hold up anymore that show its age in terms of racism patriarchy sexism and so I thought that was a good challenge and pushback for who we are and who we want to become as we carry the weight of the past into the present, into the future. And I will say just, um, this has just been written in our, you know, private Zoom comments, but um, Issa brought up this really interesting point that I did not consider at all when casting this, but how interesting that a woman of color has to die so a man can, a white man can remain in power. Uh, and I think that that's a really interesting topic that feels timely to me. And I'm sort of embarrassed to say that I didn't think about it um, when casting. I just sort of thought of the, 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 the nice things, the good things, you know, of this patient, lovely, you know, self-sacrificing woman, but that actually there's a more sinister, deeper meaning here. Um, and so I don't know if anybody has anything to say on that, but I thought that was sort of an, a, a lovely and interesting observation from Isa. I think she's spot on because that's not different from today. I mean, people of color and trans people of color die all the time. So we can maintain a cisgender, white supremacist, patriarchal, hegemonic, heterosexist hierarchy. Thank you, Bell Hooks. But <laughs> it, it's true. And so when we ask the question of how Admetus had grown or not grown, and Peter was talking about that, you know, in the happy ending, I thought it was very Disney-esque. I don't think he learned anything. I think that he learned that if he says the right things in that moment, in that time for when he utters them, he believes it and then he moves on and society is supposed to move on with him. The slaves weren't freed. The townspeople who were represented by the chorus, their lives aren't made better. The only person whose life matters at the end is the, the default leader. And I feel that we're still living through that. That's a living history in many cultures within our world today. Yeah, in my class, uh, the first global economics issue, I say to him, 60 year old white man, 6'4, you guys make pennies on my dollar. What are you going to do about it? And for a lot of them, it's the first time that it's, ever sort of dawned, you can just, you can see it in their face that they're like, well, isn't that how it's supposed to be? I actually, I mean, to, to go off of what both Jay and Tracy have said and to 
you know, bring it back to the show as well. Anne and I were talking earlier today um, about how these ancient texts have sort of laid the framework for this white supremacist patriarchal society that we live in today. Um, and they've really sort of solidify these roles even back then. I mean, this is, you know, so long ago, but that sort of laid the framework for how we're living in America in 2020. Um, and so I think that's, um, I don't know, just uh, infuriating, interesting um, things to discuss openly and um, through its uncomfortability, I believe we find change. So I, I believe it should be discussed. Um, exactly, that's why it is so pertinent to be discussed, to be, and to be discussed, uh, you know, without, well, to as much as, as we collectively are able to um, with, with civility and understanding and with one another and space and respect, but to really lean into that and to explore these questions um, and to see everything about this play from a multi-partial lens. And Julius really wanted to talk to us all tonight too, but he speaks cat, so he can't join. Um, but I think that it's really important to, to be, why also it's so important for us now, if we're going to be continuing to be telling these stories, these, these Greek tragedies, um, you know, that's something that I, as a, as a producer have been, have been sort of figuring out in my mind in the sense that, you know, for the last seven years, Relative Theatrics has exclusively done contemporary plays that have been written in the last five years that speak to the present moment. But in this sense, especially when, when with what Noelia just said, I think it is so pertinent for us to take a look at what is the root of what we, you know, what the, what the, what the white American theater says are the best plays that we should be doing right now that circles back to this. And what are the narratives that have traced their way through it all that, that then seep out into, into society as a whole, even if it's subliminal, or if we don't quite recognize, like that's why we need to have these conversations and why we need to have casting that is more diverse, that is more representative um, and brings everyone to the table to join this conversation. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. No, it's a, it's a good point because as I was trying to suggest earlier, um, Athenian democracy is an experiment and to create it, rights had to be taken away from others or you had to decide how to extend rights to males but in doing so, it took rights away from other males, and it took rights away from females to, to create this, this experiment in government. And I think in this play, and, and what Euripides is remembered in part for, is that he's potentially calling into question that he at least seems to like to bring females on the stage and have them look into the household and expose what would happen behind walls, which in theory should be invisible. You think of um, Pericles so-called funeral oration, whether he delivered, it, delivered something that actually sounded like what's in Thucydides or not what Thucydides wanted us to remember, was a speech to widows in which he tells them that the best wife, even in widowhood, is the invisible one, that you should never be praised nor should you be being rebuked in public, your name should not be said. And so we have a woman in this play who very much is coming out, the, the conventions of the theater demand her to come out of her household so she can talk to our course, so she can talk to Admetus because technically she could be doing this within the walls, but it won't work for the way things are being staged then. But in so doing and coming on the stage, you get this paradox of this definitely not invisible wife um, who is revealing what is happening in the household. Just as I would say in this play, those two servants, the two slaves are revealing what is happening within that household uh, as bookends in the actions of the play. Yeah, and I think those are very interesting. The, you know, the maid at the beginning and then the servant comes in later that they they actually do 
get to tell a narrative. They get to tell a story. And you have to think who really gets to tell stories? Who has the, you know, the privilege to do that, the power to do that? And usually it is not those people. And it would not be Alcestis either. And she gets to tell a story. So I think the play in that way is really moving. It moved me. Those sections really, um, um, I don't know, they, they felt content, more contemporary to me, I guess, perhaps, than listening to Admetus, the, the hero, if you want to call him that, um, discussing that. And another thing I find interesting is that Heracles, in some way, seems to have the higher moral stance than Admetus because he's the one who takes a risk and he seems to be the silly one. He's going off and doing these ridiculous, dangerous adventures, but he brings Alcestis back. And kind of, it's almost as if he's saying, she's back, now you have to decide who you're going to be and how you're going to live, how everybody is going to be changed by this. So I found that really quite interesting too. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but um, yeah. Just listening to you made me think of these things too. Thank you. Was there anyone else who'd like to jump in or pass a, another question? I don't have a question, but I would like to say that Anne brought up a really good point and made a good point about bringing the canon forward because even as we in Western society erase important books and voices that we will never know, it is important to bring forth the canon in a powerful way so we can highlight what works well and what doesn't work well, particularly in societies that like to market themselves as a democracy or a democratic republic. Uh, uh, something that was interesting to me as we've been doing this series is every time we read one of these shows, I find myself admiring the women in it so much with like Tecmessa and Hecuba and now Alcestis. And I just thought it was so interesting that they wrote such badass women in these shows in a time when they gave women nothing and wanted them to be invisible and all of these things. And I think in a way, that kind of maybe parallels today that we choose to write these stories that represent people and we want to perform stories that represent people, but it's like, what are you willing to say versus how much are you willing to do and mm -hmm. follow those actions through in, really, in real life? Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting as we were talking tonight. This might be a good place to tra transition to one more social justice question we had, which is to think about if Admetus were played by a female identifying individual making marriage between Admetus and Alcestis gay, how do you think the power dynamic between the two would change? Could it still be accepted in their society even just a bit? And, um, and I think that sort of plays into Jay's comments too. If, if this is a play about which partner is the lesser economically viable partner from someone's perspective. And that's why they're the one who will be volunteered or volunteer to do this. And I was sort of sort of curious if we if we have that kind of casting, would that would that change anyone's reading of the dilemmas these characters are facing? I think for me, and this is purely my lens, um, but it would make me judge as Admetus as a person um, mm -hmm. at a similar level that I judge the character if played by a cisgender man, but somehow having a cisgendered man play the role of Admetus sort of feels familiar in a very broad sense. And so it would specify it to my feelings about that character rather as rather than sort of a gender as a whole. I don't know if that's appropriate to say, but that's sort of my my very broad feeling and an unfair feel. I mean, it's not, you know, you know, we have not all women and I think also we have not all men, but um, mm -hmm. this, you know, Admetus is 
this type of character, I feel like um, many of us have seen, unfortunately, in men. But if it were reversed and played by a woman, I think I would still feel those same feelings, but it would be specified to that person. And so actually, it might be more interesting, I think, because then I could sort of forget my um, <laughs> past traumas and just focus on this character. I don't know. Those are my broad thoughts. Anybody else? I I have a feeling people would be more judgmental mm. in seeing that kind of behavior uh, and narcissism in a in a woman character. Mm. Uh, just judging by the few plays I've seen where that kind of shift has happened, uh, people are, she's just awful. I mean, how can anyone be like that? And maybe that's a good thing that then we question human behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. in that way but I my feeling is that Admetus when even if this had been performed a hundred years ago 50 years ago people would have seen him as more heroic uh, than we're seeing him now and judging him now but I in fact that would be a really very interesting uh, choice I think I would I would really like to see the play done like that and see how audience members reacted. And I agree yeah. with you, Allison. I think, you know, oh, go ahead. Uh, Nathan, were you going to say something? Yeah, just real quick. I just think, yeah, it would be really interesting. I think it would kind of change the ending a bit if Admetus were not a man, because in the end, he still faced no consequences. He still, like, made his wife die for him. He was disrespectful to her by like accepting hosts in, in their morning. And then he, I don't know, he kind of like broke her promise at the end by taking like another woman and still like kind of unsure whether or not that was her. And then I think, I don't know, he still got away with it. I think because he was a man, he faced no consequences. So, I don't know, it just makes me wonder like, yeah, how that, cha how that ending might've been different mm -hmm. had there been different circumstances. We had an interesting comment from Caitlin Skeen, who said, so interesting to consider who has the privilege to tell the story. Um, and, uh, and that is a, is a really good um, thought, it, because Alcestis is silent at the end. Uh, and, and indeed, Admetus wasn't the one who had to do the work, um, but you, get the impression he might be the one who gets to celebrate, right? He'll be in charge of the celebrations. He'll make those slaves go back to work. Who knows whether he's going, what he's going to do to them to make sure they make, they, they make come to fruition the kind of celebration he deems fit for his household. Um, you know, I'm not certain if fairies is going to be invited to that, but that's okay. Fairies might decide to have a rival celebration of his own, but you, you know, you get these, these two men who are fighting over the patriarchy in a way about which one is really in control, because at least maybe to our, our mindset, the notion that a ruler would seemingly abdicate and turn things over to the sun uh, is, is maybe not the system we think of, but it then engenders this sort of conflict of um, between the former ruler who's still a lot, very much alive and can comment on the actions of his son, the present ruler. Um, so yeah, who, who is in control of telling this story, right? By the time you, you get to the end, who lives, who dies, who tells the story, right? Yes, Hamilton. Yeah, okay. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions? Well, just because you just quoted Hamilton, I do have to say every single time in rehearsal and in performance when they would say best of women, I just started singing Hamilton to myself. <laughs> so it all comes around, but I think that that is probably, we're, we're in a good place. <laughs> yes. And I have to say, just moving forward, um, I'm really excited to see how you know, Issa mentioned earlier how each show, each Greek tragedy that we've done sort of brings to light new issues and new thoughts. And I'm excited to see moving forward what, um, what, what else comes up and how that looks. And if I may, I, I would love to just plug the next one. I'm just pulling up the exact date on my calendar. 
Good. Um, on August 27th, which is another Thursday, fourth week of August, we'll be doing Hippolytus. Um, and so I hope you all tune in for that. And I, I'm very excited to see, you know, what lessons we can learn. Laura, would you love to give a, I mean, do you have any thoughts about that or um, a little brief synopsis teaser? So to connect with this one, I would say in the Hippolytus, the question is, what happens if you decide to, to forsake all forms of love? And what kind of consequences does that have for yourself, but everyone else in your household and your community? And I would say that that's, that's in some essence what Hippolytus is about. And again, this is a play where it's named after, in this case, the male character. So this is Euripides again, and it's named after Hippolytus, uh, one of Theseus's sons, but there is going to be the character of Phaedra, uh, he, the current wife of Theseus, but stepmother, not the biological mother of Hippolytus, who will be one of the principal characters here. And again, another female, another wife, who will come outside of her household to speak to the chorus and to the other characters, and who will have a, a number of dilemmas that result from the choice of this man who is technically not biologically related to her. So that's what's coming up. Well, and something I think that'll be really exciting that we have talked about with the, with the Greek readings and the virtual programming um, as we move into the fall, we're going to try out some smaller casts as well um, to, to see, you know, with the, as it may have been done in ancient Greece, what happens when we have these doublings and is there something to be said of is, is, if, one, if one actor is playing both a male and a female identifying character, in, in the play, does that change how we also interpret those two characters? Um, so exploring those questions as well, which I think is going to be really fascinating. And if I could just leave for this play, the, the question would be, how does it affect you if the same person who's playing Alcestis was then Heracles, the one who actually, again, it's the same person who keeps having to do all the work, the one who had to volunteer to die and the one who goes and wrestles death. So, and that's, that would be the actor who was free, unless for some reason they switched masks and had Alcestis playing Admetus at that point and Admetus playing Heracles, but um, you've only got two. So who's playing Heracles at that point? Absolutely. Well, thank you all, um, all of you here and all of you in the ether for uh, tuning in for this. We really, really appreciate it. We hope you tune in next month. Uh, we'll have a drunk Shakespeare reading of A Midsummer Night's Dream the third week of August. Uh, so please tune in for that. And then a reading of Hippolytus in the fourth week, week of August. These are both on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. And thank you so much. Uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.